Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for NVMe Computational Storage from Addressing Ransomware to Improving Bandwidth. We will get started in just a few moments. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for NVMe Computational Storage from Addressing Ransomware to Improving Bandwidth. Um, I'd like to take a moment here to introduce you to our speakers. Today, we have Jason Molgard, who's Principal Storage Solutions Architect with Solidime, Scott Shadley, a Director of Strategic Planning with Solidime as well, and Tim Fisher, an STSM Flash Core Module Chief Architect with IBM. Um, with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to the speakers to kick off the webinar. Good morning, everyone. This is Scott Shadley. Um, I'm going to walk through an agenda and then I'm going to give you a little history on where we are with the computational storage market. I'll then hand it off to Jason to talk to you about using a, uh, computational storage for protecting data at rest. And then Tim will wrap us up with enterprise data resilience with uh, the Flash Core module and NVMe computational storage. And we'll plan on leaving some time at the end for Q&A. As we go through the presentation, feel free to drop questions in the in the uh, question uh, window, and we will address them as uh, we get to them at the end of the session. So, with that, I'd like to go ahead and start and talk to you about the computational storage market. So, lots of uh, people talk about why now, what's going on with this particular situation. So, I kind of want to give a little history of how we got to where we are today. Um, if you look at the worldwide volume of data growth and just take a picture of the idea of what a exponential factor we've increased with the zettabytes that we're talking about in the marketplace and things like that today. You can see that from 2010 to 2020, we had a 9x increase over that period of time. But then in just 21 to 25, it was only a 6x increase, but because of the exponential capabilities of our data growth, uh, the number of zettabytes is just becoming unmanageable. And we start running into things like data gravity and, and the ability to actually move the data we want to work with. And that's kind of one of the premises that kicked off the concepts of computational storage. Another aspect of it is where we're putting all that data. So I, I found this as a very interesting graph, just as kind of interesting insights to the world. But um, you can see the United States, of course, from a landmass perspective, dwarfs many of these from a, a usable landmass perspective. And um, if you do the math on square footage versus actual data centers, you can see that we have a 20x increase over Germany and the US and 40x over UK. But at the same time, we're only equal in size to China, and China represents a smaller number of that that's actually reported. So they're mega data centers, things like that. But it's interesting that just we're still having trouble finding places to put the data, let alone manage the data and work on the data. So then we get into the concepts of what does that mean for computational storage and what, what's really changed. And I would say that NVMe is actually one of the biggest things that impacted the ability to make this work uh, with the ability to have storage no longer being slow and being able to keep up with uh, higher speeds. We now have memory that's no longer gated. We have a certain number of DIMM slots, but we found ways around that with things like CXL and other opportunities that are starting to present themselves. But realistically, the data gravity, data size, data locality, and everything moving to the edge is causing the need for something like computational storage to exist. And the reason that that is, is if you kind of think of a data lake and going fishing for your data and pulling it off of your tape platforms, whatever the case may be, you spend a lot of time looking for your data and you spend a lot of time dragging your data from wherever it may reside. And in some cases, that can be quite a distance. Um, the concepts of computational storage are uh, actually the ability for your data to find you. And that's kind of where I get with the uh, fish jumping out of the water, if you will. Uh, and so this whole concept of pairing NVMe uh, command sets that have been released with the uh, SNEA architectures allows us to bring this whole concept and market forward. Uh, so to kind of give that where we were and where we're kind of going, our good friend, Mr. John von Neumann, came up with this concept of host memory storage. Um, and we're moving from that today. We've started adding the XPU factor. If you look at the center of the page, I put an X there because we have a DPU, an IPU, a smart NIC, and of course, our uh, near and dear favorite, uh, the GPU. 
uh, to date. But all of that just continues to stretch where the data is getting from where it needs to be to where it can be useful. And if you're storing data and you need to do work on that data, adding distance doesn't help. So why not bring the compute power that does already exist or can be taken advantage of within either a memory device or storage device and process that data in a more local environment. And that's the concept that we're migrating from this. We must have three unique places of CPU memory and storage to where we can actually marry them all into a single device and kind of have some really cool new architectures moving forward. And so that's when we switch our gears and start addressing Amdahl's law, where he talks about the ability to um, increase the efficiency and execution based on the number of processors. And so you can kind of see on the right hand side of this slide, the stars represent where that extra processing can now exist using computational storage, computational memory, computational storage drives, arrays and processors. So all of these architectures that were defined with SNEA and the command sets that were developed to work with the NVMe all represent this capability to move this market forward. So what this represents is my interpretation of our friends at Gartner's life cycle, because they build a lot of these life cycles that involve multiple um, aspects of a single market segment. So I kind of threw a whole bunch of markets on here and just represented the idea of where we kind of see computational storage has finally hit the peak of inflated expectations and have an opportunity to see more growth with it. So what I wanted to do is just give you this view and say we have all these different markets that are out there. You can see NVMe, of course, is on the plateau of productivity. We're all using it today, whether we like it or not, because it's finally become mainstream. And that's important because it gives us the opportunity to see it move forward with the other features that are on this particular roadmap. So if we take one last uh, look at the actual Gartner hype cycle to see how things progress across a life cycle, if you will, and the opportunity for them to be truly plateauing and also disappearing, if you will, to some aspect. You can see I've marked off computational storage as number one on the, the left-hand side of 2022 and last year in 23, it migrated forward, it crossed the plateau, which is a great opportunity uh, or into the peak and heading towards the trough. And we know what the trough can mean. So um, one thing that's also interesting is we do track features that do kind of disappear a little bit. And you can see, you know, uh, persistent memories had its bumps in the marketplace, if you will. So with that, I just kind of want to bring it back and say, you know, as we move this technology forward, there's a lot of people involved. Uh, I represent both NVMe and SNEA, as well as my organization. Uh, Jason and Tim are participants in all of this as well. So we see this continuing to move forward. Great opportunities for this technology. Now we're going to get into the point where Jason and Tim can actually introduce you to current and or planned implementations of this. So hopefully you get the picture of what the market looked like why we're driving this direction and what we can actually do to move it forward. So with that, I will hand it over to Jason and let him uh, take you through an actual use case. All right, thank you, Scott. So yeah, hi, I'm Jason Mulgard, and um, I'll walk you through a, a use case of uh, NVM Express computational storage, uh, and we're gonna protect data at rest. So to, to be uh, more specific, uh, so, uh, you know, we've got, um, you know, some of uh, the software layers that we can have on our, uh, system, um, you know, things that we're all familiar with, uh, that all exists and, and, and all as well. Um, and, and with computational storage, we don't want to uh, have to reinvent the wheel and come up with, you know, new solutions for uh, those types of things. Uh, so let me let me go ahead and uh, move forward a couple of slides here uh, to uh, uh, this slide. So uh, with our data integrity check, what we want to do is uh, uh, you know, check our data that's resting on the drive. And uh, so historically, this, is, this has been done frequently in data center applications. Um, it's, it's very common, it's, you know, frequently used. Uh, and, and, and so the way it has, you know, worked to today uh, uh, and before computational storage is we've got, uh, you know, potentially an object server uh, that generates shards of data, it generates uh, CRC values uh, as metadata, and that data is uh, written out to the uh, drive um, along with the metadata when it is stored. And so now on, on our uh, NVMe drive, we've got, you know, the user data, we've got metadata. Someday later or some time later, the host comes back and says, 
let's check that data, make sure that it's uh, unchanged and intact. So it starts to systematically uh, read back all of those LBAs that were written out to the drive, reads back the uh, computed CRC value. It computes a new CRC value on that data and does a comparison with the stored value and makes a determination, is the data still valid or is it not valid? And if uh, it's uh, you know not valid, of course, then it takes action and goes out and scrubs the data to make sure that it gets corrected before anything gets lost. So that process is actually very intensive, uh, very read intensive from an NVMe perspective, from a PCIe perspective. We have to you know, have a lot of traffic going across a PCIe bus uh, to move all of that data from the drive to the host. And, and as Scott showed, all the volumes of data that we're continuing to generate, that, that's becoming a lot of data to move. And, uh, and, and, and clearly is just gonna uh, create bottlenecks on the PCIe bus. So then in addition to that, you know, now that we've got all that data moved over to the host, it's got to have a place to reside. So it's consuming uh, host memory resources. That memory could, of course, be used for something else. It's consuming host uh, CPU resources. And as it computes, this, that, that CPU has to then, you know, go compute the data, or compute the CRC, do the comparison, and make the determination on whether the data is good. And, and uh, while doing all that, uh, we're... Uh, you, you, starving or depriving, I guess, is a better description, uh, the host of the ability to do other capabilities, do other functions, uh, because all the resources are consumed, performing kind of a fundamental validation to make sure that the stored data is good. And so that makes computational storage actually a really great candidate to help uh, offload some of that. So if we think about a computational storage drive with data integrity check, it, it will offload the host. So the host is really only interested in the result. It just wants to know, is the data that we stored out there good? I don't want anything to happen to it. Just make sure nothing, nothing has. So it offloads or reduces the PCIe traffic. You know, if we don't have to move that data to the host, we don't have to consume the PCIe bandwidth. We don't have to consume the power to move that data. Uh, to perform those calculations. That's a huge win uh, for the PCIe bus. Of course, it reduces the host memory footprint, so we don't have to fill the host memory with this data that we want to perform a CRC calculation. Everything we need to check the integrity of the data resides on the drive. We've, you know, we've got the data, we've got the metadata, we're, we're going to put compute resources on the drive and and then through NVMe, have the mechanism to interact with them. And it scales. Uh, as we increase the amount of storage to accommodate all this volumes of data that we're generating, the performance also increases. And that's because each drive has the ability to perform the computations on its own. We no longer have to reside, rely on this single host to move all of the data to the host to perform the computations. We no longer have to rely on the PCIe bus that is shared in order to move that data and, um, uh, and have it become saturated. So if we kind of uh, look a little bit deeper into our, our software stack and our actual computational storage drive, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we've got um, our you know, object storage software that, that is frequently used in uh, data center and enterprise type applications. Um, of course, uh, it doesn't have to be, um, but you know, thinking in terms of this use case, uh, I, it actually adds a lot of value, makes a lot of sense. Application layer, we've got our file, which happens to be a video in this case, that could be anything. The object storage is going to break that up into shards. Um, and, uh, and then the file system layer will take those shards and uh, write them uh, out to the, to the drive um, using NVMe commands. So, uh, and along with that, of course, you know, one of those LBAs likely contains our, our CRC value. So the, uh, you know, now that we have that data out there, when we wanna uh, do the operation in reverse, of course, uh, the object storage layer and the file system layer collectively, they know the, uh, the, the shards, they know the LBAs, and we can supply those uh, LBAs uh, to NVMe, uh, to our drive and, and have it go do the work. So if we kind of go one layer deeper then um, in, into the, our computational storage drive, 
Uh, we have, uh, you know, our software stack unchanged over on the left-hand side. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, uh, in, in the internals of a computational storage drive shown on the right. So uh, I'm not going to touch on all of the commands that would be necessary uh, from NVMe to set up and, and use uh, computational storage, but let's, uh, you know, highlight some of the key commands. So the first one is, uh, you know, we've just over in the lower left-hand corner of that right-hand diagram, and there's just kind of a placeholder number one that uh, says uh, NVMe CS command. So that's basically all of the commands. You can just think of that as all the commands that are going to come in from uh, and uh, over, you know, NVMe that we're going to operate on. But the actual first real command is going to be a, a, an SLM memory copy command, um, number two. And that SLM memory copy command is going to take in the, the LBAs that uh, we have from the, uh, you know, from our file system layer uh, and, and, and use those to move the data out of the NAND and into subsystem local memory. So we, we want to get that data off of, off the NAND, get it over to some sort of a you know a DRAM or SRAM, something that can be readily accessible internal to the device. So and that's what step three is showing in the upper right hand corner of, of the diagram. We've got that data moving uh, from uh, uh, NAND into our subsystem local memory or or buffer. And now that it's uh, in that uh, subsystem local memory. We now want to uh, perform our computations on it. In this case, it's a, a you know a CRC calculation and a comparison. And so we're going to uh, uh, take the the data. We're going to use a, a, a an NVMe execute program command from the computational programs command set, and and begin processing all that data. Uh, in our case, we have a, a hardware accelerator or a, or a hardware engine. That computes the CRC certainly could do it with a processor or or whatever, but you know it's really well suited for a hardware engine, and that hardware engine typically exists in uh, drives today uh, as as part of the data integrity check that 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 the drive does on itself. Um, so we're just leveraging what's already there and repurposing it and executing a program with it. So we feed all of our data uh, from that shard through the CRC engine and out comes a, a new CRC value. So with that new CRC value, uh, we can then do a comparison using the CPU and uh, that's on the drive and compare with the value that is, uh, you know, that was stored and generated by the object layer at the time that the data was written. And now we know, is this data, uh, does it match or does it mismatch? Is it the same or, or not? And we write that result back to our SLM or our buffer. And now that we know that it's uh, written out there, the command completes, uh, reports back to the host a com a completed command, and the host knows my result is now available. And it can go retrieve that result using uh, an SLM read command, and it can read that data out of SLM and off to the host and, and get that value and know, did, you know, is it match or mismatch? And, and once it has that data, it can make a determination is the shard still valid or is it not valid? Do I need to go take further action? And of course, we're going to repeat this process for uh, each of the shards that uh, is required uh, and that we want to scrub on, on this particular drive. And once we have finished that, we can you know, say we've we have scrubbed the entire drive. We've checked the integrity of the entire drive. So now let's go ahead and uh, take a look at um, some results. So we've got. Uh, you know, several things shown here on this uh, diagram. So the blue bars are showing the performance of running a CRC calculation and check on the host. And the orange bars are showing the performance of running that same CRC calculation and check on the drive. Not surprisingly, the host can do that check faster up to a point. And so uh, with this particular example, uh, once we get to about five drives, what we're finding is the PCIe bandwidth becomes the bottleneck. It becomes completely saturated, and and uh, and we can't move the data across it any faster. We can't move any more data at that moment in time. Whereas, if we look at the the orange bars, as we continue adding drives, it continues. The performance continues to increase because each drive is able to perform the calculations on their own. 
And I think that's that's you know really a huge win for for the system. It's a huge win uh, for NVMe as well because now additional commands can be serviced uh, and and execute in parallel while we're performing this this very you know basic but necessary function of uh, checking the integrity of the data. So on this slide, we repeated the same experiment, but with slightly newer hardware, slightly newer drives. Um, and then of course we added a lot more drives to really highlight the fact that as we add drives, uh, the performance continues to increase, but the, but the host performance, if we were to continue doing this operation on the host, does not, it is very much flat. Um, our crossover points are a little bit different. Um, you'll notice because we, we have, uh, you know, some slightly different hardware, uh, but, but the, 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 message is the same in that the data, the, the performance grows linearly as we add drives. Uh, and again, it's because each drive is able to perform computations on, on its own. All right, so with that, let me kind of uh, wrap up uh, this use case for uh, NVM Express computational storage. And, and that is that it is really ideal for processing low level tasks on the drive. So we're utilizing the existing hardware engines or accelerators. In our case, it's a CRC engine. We're exist utilizing the existing software solutions. So we've got this object storage that's generated shards and, and computed uh, CRC values. None of that had to change. The only thing we had to do is add NVM Express computational storage. And I think that you know one of the really huge wins here is, uh, for computational storage is the fact that we're able to operate on sharded data for this use case. This has been a major objection to computational storage that I've heard from many folks for a very long time. Hey, you got the data broken up across multiple drives. How do you possibly compute on it? Well, this is how. This is a great use case for that. We don't have to bring all that data to the host. We don't have to bring it all together. Uh, we, we just do the op operations right there on the drive and it becomes a major value add to the concerns of data locality. We're not moving all that data uh, in order to, to you know, check the integrity. Of course, it scales across multiple computational storage drives. Each drive works independently, but collectively they bring a huge increase in performance to the system. And, and we are seeing that linear scaling as we add more drives. It's, it's really a, uh, you know, quite fantastic. And I think that, you know, what's also very important here is that as we're using NVM Express commands to, to do this uh, particular offload and saving all of this PCIe bandwidth, it doesn't preclude us from doing additional computations on the drive. The NVM Express command sets allow for additional programs above and beyond one. And, and this is not a, the data integrity check is not a burdensome calculation. So we can easily have additional programs running on the drive using the resources that are available, enabling you know a new use cases as as they mature. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to walk us through another use case. Thank you, Jason. That was a that was a great use case. Thank you for that. Um, my name is Tim Fisher. I work on the uh, Flash Core module, and I am representing IBM. And we'll talk a little bit more about the flash core module. So we like to say this is not just an SSD. This is, in fact, a computational storage device. The current offering is uh, FCM4. So we're on our fourth generation of flash core module. And these modules are uh, dual port U.2 form factor uh, NVMe SSDs. Today, we for the last since FCM2, actually, we've been, we've been using 100% QLC for any workload. So that's all we use in our, our flash core module storage products is QLC. And we guarantee at least a seven year endurance with QLC. Uh, the compu other computational storage features that are in the flash core module are hardware compression and decompression, <clears throat> as well as hardware encryption with TCG Opal. <clears throat> so we do have uh, currently four capacity points, what we like to call small through extra large. And what's shown there is the, on the left side, the terabyte usable, that is our raw physical NAND that we're presenting to the host. And then our effective capacity is, is what we can map uh, due to our, uh, an increase in our logical to physical tables. And this is due to compression. So in many cases, it's, it's about three to one, sometimes more in the small case. But the idea here is not that the compressor can only do three to one, it can compress much greater than that. This is just the amount of logical to physical table mapping that we can expose in the drive. 
So that's kind of the breakdown of terabyte usable versus terabyte effective. And we are in queue for the FIPS 140-3 with our FCM4 offering. As many of you may know, this can take up to several years for this to complete. So uh, we we started selling uh, Flash Core Module 4 at the end of last year. So it could be a little while before that uh, completes, but it is in progress. And today we are selling our Flash Core modules exclusively in IBM storage appliances, uh, primarily IBM Flash systems. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, a big problem happening right now in the storage industry. And specifically what I want to focus on is cybersecurity, but also cybersecurity that are cyber attacks that are attacking your data, right? There's many different forms of cyber attacks, you know, locking out system access, things like that. But what I want to talk about today is specifically targeting your data. And so if we look down at the very bottom there, 49% of cyber attacks these days are targeting your data with 24% of those being ransomware and about 25% of those being destructive, which is, which is extremely um, unnerving, right? Ransomware, you have a hope of getting your data back, but when it's destructive, it's gone. And so what we're finding through our, our research with IBM X-Force is that 85% of people that get, have a data attack are not able to fully restore their data from a backup after the attack. And also what we're seeing is 66% of the breaches are not identified by the tools that, that the storage uh, admins have in place to detect these kind of attacks. So it's becoming an extre uh, increasingly larger problem from year to year. Okay, so now let's tie it back to computational storage. So what does this have to do with computational storage? So an SSD, it has visibility to the data flowing in the system. Right at one at some point or another, even if there's caching above, the data is going to land in the SSD and at some point maybe read from the SSD. And in the FCM case, the FCM can compress and encrypt this data in hardware with little to no performance penalty. There's other various transforms that can be made on the data. So just analyzing the data, the data patterns, things like that. And again, this is in hardware, so there's little to no performance penalty. And the other thing the FCM has, it tracks extents within the flash to determine write heat, read heat, and just various uh, access patterns and the types of accesses that are happening to the drive. And then additionally, as I know Jason had mentioned in his, when you're talking about shards and things across multiple FCMs that are multiple SSDs that may not know that there's other SSDs in this appliance, you can, in fact, pass additional information like the volume, like the file, and things like that so that the FCM does have a reference above what it knows from a uh, block storage con uh, context. So, so what this means is that trends and predictions can, in fact, be intelligently made at the SSD level. Okay, so now this makes you kind of consider. So in the past, people have said, you know, block storage is block storage. You know, you just write the data, you read it back. Uh, you know, it's missing a lot of context. You don't know what application's running. You don't know how many multiple users there are connected through, you know, HBAs and things like that. So you're missing a lot of context. And that's true. But what it can do is it can compute data needed for identifying intrusion attacks. So with less performance impact than any part of the system, uh, the SSDs can, can look at this data and, and do a lot of computation for you. So, you know, I'm sure drum roll. So this makes for a very interesting computational storage application, which is SSDs can help in early threat detection. So things like ransomware, an example would be someone reading your data, encrypting it with a key that you don't have, writing it back. Uh, wiperware, where someone gets access to your system and starts removing files and just deleting them. And then exfiltration, where someone, again, will still take your read your data off, store it somewhere else, and then just kind of keep it there, uh, expecting some kind of you know, payment in return for returning it. So the idea here is not necessarily that the SSD itself is going to detect the ransomware, but it can help compute the data necessary for determining that you may be under attack. And so with our FCM4, we have released this entire ecosystem in our flash system product you know, starting at the, the drive with computational storage, going up to our software stack, out to the IBM cloud, 
And then that makes a full circle back to the system and ultimately to the FCM. And, and this is in fact um, on the market today and we are actively gathering information and, and uh, metrics from the FCM4 and the ecosystem that we have in place. Okay, so what is this built on? So this is built on the, uh, the computational structure uh, infrastructure that was proposed in the NVMe concepts for computational programs and subsystem local memory. So this, when we built this and we put this out, this was all done before these were added to the NVMe uh, Express specification. So as of now, these are officially added, so they are no longer concepts, uh, but or originally this was built on the concept. And our use case today is still primarily within our own clients. We control the software stack, we control the hardware and the firmware on the FCM, and we can uh, adapt it. We wanted to adapt this infrastructure versus doing our own homegrown infrastructure because this provides a lot of ways for us to upgrade in the future. As new uh, computational storage features come about, we have this infrastructure for the computational programs and subsystem local memory built in and allows us to pivot to other use cases fairly quickly. But for this one, we, we thought that, and this was, you know, through, this was a company-wide decision that we've made at a, at a company level. We thought that cybersecurity and specifically intrusion detection was one of the next big things in computational storage, where the FCM can kind of, can analyze data and feed that information back to our software stack. And the software stack can ultimately provide alerts to the users, as well as use our existing safeguard copy feature within our flash appliances, where if we detect an anomaly, we can actually start locking down data for you in less than a minute. So that if in fact you are be under attack, we have a, a copy of your information that is before the attack uh, was occurring. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of low-level detail. I, I just, I'm not sure all the different aspects of folks that are on this call, but I like to kind of give some high-level as well as a little bit of low-level. And so here's a little uh, overview of our FCM controller. So we are in fact in the AMD or Xilinx Versal FPGA. These FPGAs come with uh, some two powerful APUs, the Cortex A72, as well as real-time processors, the Cortex RF5, and a lot of programmable logic. So this is again, an enterprise QLC, SSD and CSD. And so the number one goal here is that this thing needs to do its job as a block storage device. And, and that, is, that is what customers are buying this for. The computational storage feature is, is a big enhancement to that, but it cannot disturb the function of the normal SSD. So things like performance and stuff like that, we really don't want to affect any of that from the storage aspect. And so in order to do this computational uh, platform that we have, we heavily use the RPUs, uh, the real-time processing units for a lot of our processing. And the APUs are used to basically communicate with the host system. And the programmable logic is a big part in how we can do these computations and feed it to the RPUs without affecting our IO speed. And so this is what it, the, the SSD will look like when you plug it in. So traditionally, we ha you have an NVM namespace that appears. And with FCM4, you will also get a computational namespace and a subsystem local memory namespace. Now, internally, what we're doing is we have uh, data on the FCM drive, some DRAM on the FCM drive that we're setting aside for this collection and summarization. And in this DRAM, we are heavily guarding what we call memory barriers, the access to this to make sure that, you, that anything that got onto the drive could not access the other FTL uh, spaces. It can only operate in its memory that's allocated for this specific feature. And so what's happening here is the PL is kind of gathering the data and it's putting it into this allocation area in memory. The RPUs are then looking at that, out, that collection of data. They're doing a bunch of computation on it and, and basically providing a summary to the host through the subsystem local memory. And so some of the, just to give you kind of an idea, so we are doing 40 plus data statistics that we're gathering within the FCM. And so um, I'm not gonna cover all those, but some of the important ones that we're looking at. So because we have a compressor, 
we do provide the compression statistics. And we also do analysis on the data. I was talking before about various transforms. We do Shannon entropy as well as chi-squared. And so effectively looking for the amount of randomness in your data. We, and with this, we can do encrypted payload detection. Uh, we're also monitoring your, your throughput so we can ch detect changes in read and write throughput. And we also monitor you where you're accessing in the drive. So we're keeping all these statistics about uh, your IO. And we do this on every single IO, trims, writes, reads, it doesn't matter. We're, we're doing this on all of them. And of course, you know, ignoring the ones that are coming from our system, things like you know, scrubbers and stuff like that, that's not coming from the host application. And we can do this with, with zero performance impact. And so here's a high level uh, view of what it looks like and why we think this is the right place to be doing this. So as data comes in from the host over the NVMe and PCI, the, we can do this IO analysis and in a sideband provide this information down. So IO analysis, this is the you know heat access patterns, throughput changes, as well as the data analysis. What does your data look like? How well does it compress? Uh, and then any other uh, metrics that are coming from our various hardware modules. And we put all this together and just funnel this down into, into the memory. And the RPUs then will go and chew through all that data. And we don't want to send all that data up to the host, right? We want to send a summary of that data. And that's the role of the RPU. They're going to go put that into something that's manageable to be consumed by the host application for, through your subsystem local memory. And so this plugs into our flash systems products that I mentioned before. And so it is it is kind of an entire ecosystem, right? This computational platform. Uh, so IBM has kind of a commitment to protecting against cybersecurity. This is a big focus company-wide, as I mentioned. Our safeguarded copy, storage defender, uh, storage sentinel, and now the FCM intrusion detection hints. And so one of the big uh, positives we have for this platform is you know, one of the, when I talk to customers and we talked to them about ransomware, we did a lot of research before we implemented this. And the biggest number one complaint was false positives. So I get alerts, you know, every day saying that I'm, I have an attack and I, there's been a copy of this volume made and it is locked. And so the admin has to go in, determine, is there an attack? If there's not, then they have to go through a bunch of hoops to unlock this storage that has been locked down. And if there's a lot of false positives, this becomes a nightmare for a storage admin. And so this is the number one reason for people to turn off their ransomware detection. And what makes this unique is, as mentioned in other, other, uh, the other use case, volumes, files, things like that, they're all spread across all these drives. And so what happens is if you can provide that information to the drive, like a volume or file, then each drive can independently analyze the data. And then when it passes these hints up to the storage stack, the storage stack can look at all the FCMs and say, well, this one's reporting some unusual analysis. Let me check the other ones that are part of the same volume and see if I can build my confidence that all the that multiple FCMs that are part of this volume are indeed seeing the same anomaly. And so we believe that alone can help to kind of to revolutionize uh, to revolutionize the detection and overall accuracy, as well as the speed of recovering from a cyber attack. Okay, and just to close it out, so we believe this, uh, the use case in the FCM for ransomware detection hints is going to be the future of uh, storage-based resiliency and recovery. And of course, while we're, he while we're here today, it's all using uh, the NVMe computational storage features. Thank you very much for your time. I'll turn it over to Nolan. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive into the Q&A here. Um, if you do have any questions, just go ahead and post them in the questions box. Uh, the first question I have here is for Scott. Um, so what is unique about the NVMe computational programs compared to the computational storage market discussions? So it, it's an interesting uh, question, and it comes up actually quite a bit in, in the conversation. So if you look at how the ecosystem evolved when we created, quote unquote, the, the terminology of computational storage and brought it to kind of more of a mainstream market back in 2018, 
that work was driven in SNIA, which is the complementary, one of the complementary standards bodies to NVMe, and they defined an architecture. And the uniqueness there is an architecture it allows it to be somewhat transport agnostic. And so then once we have an architecture and a capability to understand how it should function, we now need to implement it. And so we uh, partnered with and worked alongside NVMe and NVMe Express to actually create the protocol requirements around that. And that's what kind of allows this market to continue to evolve to the, the points made by both um, Jason and Tim, you know, without a standard, it becomes custom and custom's not really the way the market in the world is going today. So we had a architecture in place. Now we have a transport protocol in place that people can use to help drive the market forward. And that's kind of how um, the whole ecosystem is evolving and, and turning this into a, a mainstream opportunity, if you will. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason, my next question is for you. Um, why does NVMe have computational programs when SNIA already has an architecture? Yeah, so as Scott kind of touched on a little bit of that, but uh, let me see if I can add a little bit more color. Um, so basically, uh, you, you, the SNEA architecture is very much um, uh, agnostic to the transport. And so, you know, NVMe happens to be the preferred transport for SSDs. That's, you know, where a lot of the focus is this, these days uh, in terms of, you know, new development for, for storage devices. And so it, it became very logical for uh, NVMe to um, add the capabilities needed to support computational storage. So while you may have this high level, here's what we'd want to do over in SNEA, we really needed to get down to the the nuts and bolts and figure out how are we actually going to do it. And that's exactly what um, was done in uh, in NVM Express. And um, I know that uh, many of the folks, myself included, who worked on the architecture also worked on the uh, NVM Express um, command sets. And we, you know, we were very cognizant of trying to keep both in mind, um, even though they were being done in you know different organizations. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we needed to come up with a, how to use NVMe to make computational storage work. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Tim, this next question is for you. How will the FCM detect future cyber attacks that are not yet known or identified? Okay, thank you. Before before I answer that, let me, if I can, just add a little bit to the uh, the NVMe computational program. So one of the things that we ran into, where because it was based on concepts, is you know you have this infrastructure in place, but you do have to do custom APIs at a driver level in order to use these uh, different namespaces. And so the hope here is that you know in future NVMe dis uh, Linux distributions that the base NVMe package contains all that for you. And that's why I think that another reason why that's important is it eliminates a lot of the API work at a driver level that folks have to do to use uh, the computational storage and some system local memory. Okay, so go, moving on to the uh, cyber attack. So, so as I mentioned, uh, we built an ecosystem here. And so what we have is data being passed from the FCM or being read from the FCM to a upper level software stack. And there is actually a, uh, an inference engine within the software stack. And so we have trained the, we have uh, trained the model for that inference engine. And basically what we're doing is data from the flash systems is all being fed back to the IBM cloud. And we're constantly analyzing that data. Along with our X-Force, as I mentioned, our X-Force security team that are constantly looking for new threats out there, we then will, will train uh, new models, just ongoing train new models. And when we have a, a new model that we want to release, we can do a basically a patch to the software application that's seamless to the user, seamless to the storage application, where we can add a new uh, machine learning model for the inference engine to ingest. And so that's how we're going to continue to keep pace with new attacks uh, with our existing infrastructure. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, this one's for you, Scott. Uh, when do you believe the adoption of computational storage will take off in the market slash industry? You know, it's, it's another interesting question and kind of to what we've all been talking to of how it's evolving today. Um, if you look back and take a, a historical view of things, people are always like, it's, it's not moving fast enough. It, you know, it's never really going to happen. But even NVMe and NVMe Express started in 20, 
11, 2012, and really became mainstream, you know, almost a decade later as we are seeing it now getting that adoption rate. So I would say that with the advent of the architecture in place, with the advent of a protocol in place, and to kind of even Tim's point about the evolution of that ecosystem, we're going to see it becoming much more relevant in the very near future. But as the, the hype cycle shows, you know, as all technologies work, there's a path to ultimate implementation. And I think we're still probably a couple of years to that everyone everywhere is using it kind of perspective. But as you can see from the couple of examples that we've shared today, there are already you know, aspects of it in place and being deployed. So it's certainly here to stay and it's just on its adoption path, if you will. Great, thank you. Uh, Jason, this question goes to you. Uh, why are there different NVMe namespaces involved in computational storage? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, obviously, before we started the work on the computational storage uh, command sets, there was already uh, the NVM command set that everyone is familiar with in terms of, you know, actually storing the data. And uh, we, we started with a new command set, computational programs, uh, defined the, you know, uh, commands and features and capabilities and everything needed to actually make it work. Realized that we needed to have the um, the concept of memory, you know, subsystem local memory, as it affectionately became called, uh, in order to to have the you know some sort of compute engine operate on. And uh, it was decided, well, you know, instead of actually folding it in, keeping it separate, helps kind of break up the problem, makes it a little bit easier to understand, and then more importantly. Subsystem local memory doesn't have to just be used for computational storage. Um, that is the primary application for it today. Um, but by having it be separate, it you know enables different capabilities in the future. And um, uh, you know we'll see what those are. There's nothing you know that I'm aware of today. That doesn't mean somebody isn't off thinking of some fantastic use. Uh, but that explains why we kind of end up with you know computational programs and subsystem local memory as two different command sets, and um, obviously the existing NVM command set that we that we all know. Great, thank you. Um, so that appears to be our last question for today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for your questions today. Um, and thank you to our speakers and everyone for joining. Um, if you would like, the webinar video will be available to view uh, via Bright Talk, as well as the NVM Express YouTube channel. Um, and these slides will also be available to download on the NVM Express website. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs>